That was the best I could do. We had heard about the guy, the preacher couldn't be there, and he got up and said, now the regular preacher's not here today, if anybody's missed it, I just wanted you to know that, and, says, and I'm just kind of filling in for him, kind of like you had a, you know, you broke a window and you put a piece of cardboard in there until you could get it fixed right, I'm just kind of filling in, somebody on the way out said, ah, you're not a piece of cardboard, you're the real pain. <laughs> Get where we're going to be. I need that later. Let's go ahead and get started because it is seven o'clock, and maybe a moment after, we have a lot to talk about that we won't be able to even do this whole quarter. All these good topics, so we'll get as much as we can tonight. Good to see everybody. Good to have at least one visitor. And. Uh, Good to see you all. We're going to begin with prayer and uh, looking for uh, Greg. He's back there and he has the microphone. So it's ready to go, Greg. Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful to come before you this evening and set aside our cares and concerns and, and focus on your word. And Father, we're so grateful for Steve and as he bringing these lessons about the challenges that we face in our Christian homes. Lord, um, before we go into this period of Bible study, we just want to continue uh, to remember the Manzaray family, Father. We want to lift up uh, Janetta May before you and, and Jan Leonard and Carolyn Simpson and Ken Morgan, Father, and there's just so many in our number that we're concerned about, and we just want to uh, continue to put them before you for healing and, and to give their families peace and comfort, Lord. And, and please go with us through the remainder of this hour. Help us to open our minds and to, to study your word and to come to a better understanding of your son, Jesus. And it's through his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. We did not get through the planned material for last week. So really quick as I flip forward the slides, we we're talking about, if anybody's here for the first time, challenges to the Christian home. We we're not talking about specifically the kind of lessons that we often teach in a class on marriage, family, and home. But we are talking about the things that Satan is throwing at the family, the Christian family. We're specifying some of those. You gave me a list that you would like to talk about. I had a list of things I wanted to. I put those together, blended them, and that's what we'll be talking about. We talked about last week as we began the challenge of social media and media. We talked about social media, and we'll look at the definition when we get down a little. Well, we'll go ahead now. Media is means of communication, is radio and television, newspapers, magazines, the internet to reach out and influence people widely. Social media are forms of electronic communication in which there's a kind of interaction of communication. Websites, social networking, microblogging, through which users create an online, online communities to share information, ideas, personal messages, and other content. So media is just sort of one way. They push it out there to many people as they can. Social media is like the word suggests. It's social. People are, are, are talking to one another, spreading ideas back and forth. And uh, it's a number of forms that has really caught on just in the last few years because the technology was not there before. Okay, we're going to go past all of these scriptures that we talked about as we talked about some of the things dealing with social media. And we're going down to well, I thought I had it marked, but let me be sure here. Oh, I know, I know exactly where I want to start. Okay, correction. Last last week, First Samuel sixteen and verse seven, I was informed that I did one of those insert the name uh, of the wrong person when you're talking about a scripture. Okay. First, first Samuel 16, 7, of course, is where uh, Samuel's look upon the heart, and I think I said uh, Saul, and of course it's David, uh, not Saul, 
the, the first king of Israel, not, or the, the second king of Israel, not the first. So uh, correct that in case I, you know, made anybody confused. You know, I know differ- the difference in that. Just sometimes you put the wrong name in the uh, comment. Okay, and then from verse 4 and verse 23 was about where we ended up last week. And the point that we were considering, these, these were all, by the way, suggestions as we deal with social media. You know, some pros, cons, some, some principles, guidelines to help us, both ourselves and the members of our family. And here, I think this is about the 13th one, keep your heart with all diligence for out of it spring the issues of life. Our heart, or more specifically, our mind, which contains our our understanding, our will, our emotions, all the stuff that makes us us, which is different than just the physical body. The other stuff that is us is our heart. And if we will nurture that heart, if we will fill it with good things, as mothers and fathers, husbands and wives, children, teenagers, then uh, that's going to basically be the controlling factor uh, on the things that spring out of us, the things that we do, the life that we live. Whatever we fill ourselves with is going to be reflected on, in the life that we lived. So we're talking here about uh, what we allow into our minds. And on social media, lots of junk that we don't want to allow into our minds. Things can be used for good, and we talked about that some, but things can also be misused. And then I believe we talked about this quickly because we were running out of time, along with the idea as uh, filling your mind with the right things, the right spiritual diet. What do you think about? And on the internet, on other forms of social media, you can fill it with negative things, uh, ungodly things, shallow things that may not be evil in themselves but are basically worthless in value, or you can fill it with the things like Paul suggests right here. Things that are noble, just, pure, lovely, of good report. The things that have virtue and are praiseworthy. Filling our minds with these. If we will use that guideline as we approach social media, if we will use that as, as one of the determining factors for how much social media we let into our lives and what kind of social media we allow into our lives, and then the same thing for our children as we, as we train and nurture them, uh, then we'll be doing well. We'll be using a tool in the way that God would have us and not abusing or misusing that tool, which certainly can be done. And then, we did not get to this one at all, I don't think, last week. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things. But I have commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, you might be thinking, well, this, you know, this Jesus' commission, that, that's great, but how does this interact with what we're talking about here in social media? Well, that's one of the good things. Through technology, we can reach people today that we never dreamed of reaching before. Now, I mentioned a little bit about, uh, just I gave an example of Apologetics Press. Uh, a good work, a printed material mostly. They have some, some uh, audio and video some, uh, items, but mostly printed material, and especially on the internet, they have a presence. And I mentioned some of the things about them, but... What they have is the ability to reach out to 303.2 billion people who were on the internet. And this was last year's page, so I'm sure it's more by now. 3.2 billion people, close to half of the people in this world, at least a big portion of them, who cannot be reached any other way. And they can, through the electronic word, not the printed word, but the electronic word, e-pages, they call them, they can reach people, and they are all over the world. You go to Apologetics Press and look at their, uh, some of their material, 
And you can see dots all over the world where they have had people that came and looked for information. And they just have tons of good information, both about uh, just general ethical questions, about evolution versus creation, uh, about evidences for the existence of God and, and uh, the validity of the Bible, the inspiration of the Bible. So much good stuff that it is a way to reach people. And I did mention this, I think, last week. Their pages, their electronic pages are viewed so frequently that the rate would be average 1.4 pages of electronic material per second. You see, that's a lot of people in the world. You know, we may be asleep here, but somebody on the other side of the world, it's the middle of the day for them, and they're looking up a biblical subject. And they might find it on Apologetic Express. And when they do, they'll find nothing but the truth. And so it's just, I use that as an example. We can do things ourselves. We can teach people who are far away that we do not have the ability and travel to them. It can go to places where, because of governmental control, it might be that uh, that's the only way that people will ever come in contact with the truth. You know, there's places where the government maybe, maybe can keep books away from people, printing material, but the Internet is still there, accessible, and people are still free to go on there and find that out. So as we think about this, as we talk about the idea of uh, evangelism, global evangelism, or evangelism here in this country, just somewhere where we couldn't go in person, we think about the resources also that are available for our families and for our children. We just need to, to guide them, to lead them in the right direction, to show them here's, here's what's good about the Internet, and here's something that will be good for you. And then this final uh, principle here or suggestion Therefore, my beloved, free, flee from idolatry. And the point there, the guideline, the suggestion, has to do with the fact that anything can become an idol to us. We're familiar with idols that existed back in Bible times. But, of course, the thing is, anything that comes between us and God is an idol. God said, you shall have no other gods before me. And if something comes before God, then it becomes an idol. It's too important to us. And social media can do that. We can, we can spend way too much time on these things. And even things that are, and I think, I know we talked about this last week, even things that are not inherently evil, we can spend too much time on those that we ought to be spending in studying God's word, speaking to God in prayer, living lives of influence with other people as we try to share uh, the good news with them. So we want to be sure that social media and no form of it becomes an idol to us. Now, the second category, and I don't have as much on that, but the second category in this lesson that was prepared for last week is simply media. And remember, media is basically a one-way thing. It's basically someone who is interested either in making money or promoting a certain way of thinking or something like that. They have a purpose for it. They try to shoot information out in a wide distribution. The more people they can get to hear it, of course, the better. The more people that buy a newspaper or listen to a commercial uh, or whatever, they, they're glad for that. So that's media, not so much interaction of two or a group of people like social media. And as we think about that and how it can impact and not impact the uh, Christian family, we've got some scriptures and suggestions on that. First, a reminder, though, and since we just saw this a moment ago, not a big deal. Just remember, media, social media, two different things. All right. 
you may have actually seen stickers to put on your television with this on it. I've seen them. I've seen people who have these on their television. It is certainly a good principle to remember. I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. And the greatest, the greatest uh, villain in all of this, potential villain, of course, is the television. Where there are things on there that uh, we would never ourselves go close to, and yet we see them portrayed, spoken, uh, visualized. There are things on there that perhaps some people would allow their children to look at or listen to, and they would be totally irate if someone out in the world were to expose their children to that same kind of behavior or that same kind of language. And let, yet they allow it when the TV comes into the house. Uh, one more, then I want to share a quote with you. Jeremiah, remember Jeremiah is weeping over the destruction of Jerusalem, the Babylonian captivity starting. And as he writes Lamentations, perhaps he was, he was watching from a distance what had happened. At any rate, he knew what had happened to his beloved Jerusalem and to his people. My eyes bring suffering to my soul because of all the daughters of my city. Because of what he saw, he was emotionally moved and he writes the book of Lamentations, a big reason for why we call him the weeping prophet. Because of what he saw, he was impacted emotionally. Because of what we see, we are, we are impacted emotionally and in, a, in means of behavior sometimes. And there are people whose vested interest is to control television and put anything on there they want to, who will argue at some length that television doesn't affect you. And yet, on the other hand, what are they doing? They're creating these shows in an attempt to grasp people. People who are able to pay it are buying huge amounts of, sending huge amounts of money on commercials to affect people, right? To make someone watch it and to make them buy the product from the people who are making the commercials. It's, it's about making money. For, so, for, so for some of them to say, oh no, television, television doesn't affect you, it's just a safe recreational thing. There's, there's a whole total contradiction there and we all realize that. The only people who would say television doesn't affect the people who watch it um, as a whole are the people who don't want us to think that. And of course, it does affect us in a great way. I, I read this little line here from uh, an article that someone else had written, and I'm not sure I can quote it, so let me see if I can read it just right here. Okay, uh, he was writing the article, he said he saw an advertisement on the side of a city bus, and of course in you know, larger cities you see this all the time, you know, advertisements, especially even re related to the media and forms of it. And the city bus advertisement on the side said, bring the world into your home, turn to channel 43. And you know, there's a great little truth in that. You're bringing the world into your home. Do you want your children to see the world in that way? And I'm not necessarily disrespecting news sources here, but they were saying Channel 43, everything on Channel 43, wherever that was. Do we want our children to be exposed to the world and think, this is the normal way the world operates? Well, that's, that's what television tells them. It leaves the impression this is normal. This is how families act. They're all dysfunctional. They're all ungodly. Uh, the father is a, is a clown, and the children have the, the best judgment of all, and people engage in all sorts of ungodly behavior, and then they have a laugh track with it. 
Do we want the world coming into our home on any channel, on a television? So it's very, very powerful. Here's some uh, statistics, or actually more correctly statements, I guess. This is uh, from a report a few years ago prepared by the Judiciary Committee of the United States Senate. And it was all about the impact of television. It said that crime, violence, brutality, sadism, and eccentric sex on the television screen must be regarded as a major factor contributing to the rising tide of juvenile delinquency all across the land. Now, I would suggest that we really didn't need senators to figure that out, that we all could probably have figured that out without some kind of committee in Washington. But they did this. Perhaps that adds a little bit more credibility to some people to it. The committee found that in, for instance, one 60-minute program that they studied in this, in this uh, particular uh, study, 13, there were 13 killings, nine shootings, two stabbings, one torture, and one smothering. And that particular show was broadcast early on Christmas Eve when <laughs> how many children are around to watch television? So it, it's a powerful force that is, well, I, I think I would be safe saying, and if you disagree with me, you can certainly voice it. I think we'd be safe in saying that it, there is more harm than there is good out of television. If, if, it didn't, if it weren't so a few years ago, it certainly is today. But there can be good things on television. There are things that are worth seeing but we need to be judicious in that. And I've got some suggestions in just a moment. But uh, it's a matter of what we let go into our eyes that goes into our brain, that goes into our behavior if we're not very, very careful and certainly impacts our children. Fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. We're responsible for feeding our children spiritually. And the television is a place where there's a great deal of uh, food without any nourishment. Or in fact, going to the other extreme, there's, there's food with poison in it. When we think about television, we think about nurturing them. We also think about nurturing ourselves. It would be foolish of us to say, well, now my children don't need to watch all these things, but I am immune. I'm a Christian. I've been a Christian X number of years. And I, you know, I've, I've seen a little bit of the world, so I can handle anything that's on the screen. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men teaching us that Denying godliness and unworldly uh, worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. What should we be nourishing ourselves with? And what I'm saying is we ought to be nourishing ourselves with a lot of other things besides television because there's so many empty calories and there is so much poisoning. Now, I have uh, 10 suggestions that I want to share with you. These were written up. I, I don't even know exactly the source, but they're worth sharing as we think about it. And it says basically a lot of the things that uh, I think we want to say. 10 suggestions. Let's go to the slide that says suggestions. There we go. Ten suggestions. Guard your heart. Proverbs 4.23 says, Above all else, guard your heart. Go, guard what goes into your eyes, what goes into your ears, and therefore what goes into the part of you that makes decisions that decides what is moral and what is not, 
what is godly and what is not. Guard your heart and guard the heart of the young person that may want to see that show, but perhaps shouldn't. As, as we evaluate a show, the world would say, well, is, does this suit my taste? Is this one of my favorite shows? The Christian would better be served by saying, is this a show that God would be comfortable with me watching? I read one comment, somebody said, uh, if uh, they had television back in Jesus' day, can you see Jesus and the apostles gathering around a TV set to watch this show that you're about to watch? That's a lot of imagination there necessary, but the question is still a good question. You know, if you're watching that show and, and the Lord came into the living room, would you turn it off? Well, you turn it off anyway and talk to Jesus, right? You wouldn't worry about television show. But would you be uncomfortable with the fact that he just saw what you were watching? And as we've already suggested in, a, in, in past lessons, uh, he doesn't have to be in the living room to know what you're watching, okay? So guard your heart. Record cherry-picked TV programs with a DVR. And boy, technology has helped us in that way, hasn't it? We can, and we can go through the commercials fast forward. <laughs> but we can pick out shows that might be of some recreational entertainment value, shows that might be of some educational worth for us or for our children, and we can record them. And then there are no surprises because we, we've recorded them, and we can hit that stop button real quick, and, and uh, we don't have to expose ourselves to a lot of things that are not good for us. Uh, here's a suggestion for people with children especially. Choose a filtering device to watch television programming. There are devices out there that you can hook up to your TV that, uh, and I can't imagine how it does it, but it, it, recognizes, it recognizes profanity. It recognizes the curse words and it zaps them out. Pretty neat stuff. Technology's helped us again. But that's one option. If we are going to watch a show, then, and we're not sure of exactly every word that's going to be used. Invite the television into your family only when it has something good to say and to show. Just as you ask, is this good for me? Will this be any, you know, will the Lord see me as nurturing my spiritual welfare? Also, my children. Would it, would it be good for them as well? Keep the home television in a well-tracked area. And the folks say the same thing about computers too. And in this day and time when people have multiple televisions in the house, multiple computers in the house, it's probably very tempting to allow a child to have a television or computer in their own room which means how much control does a parent have over it? Unless they figure out some other way to control it, they're not going to be able to control it by seeing how it's being used. So a computer or a television, we're talking about TV right now especially, in a place where everybody knows what's going on. There's no hiding, there's no secrets. It's right there in a room where everybody walks through every once in a while. And there is, in that sense, transparency a well-trafficked area. And I like this one. Talk back to your TV. If you are watching something with your children and something happens on there and you, that light bulb comes on and you say, wow, a teaching moment. This show has just shown something that is morally right. And I want to emphasize that talk about it right then that's one of the good things about dvr you just hit pause and talk to your children about it what did you see just happen just there right then it was that good or was that bad same thing if something questionable comes up instead of letting it go by talk about whether that was a good decision or not it was not a good decision and say is that something that that uh, should be done that way what sort of Guidelines would God's word give us for that? Would he be pleased with behavior like that? So talk to your television, and which literally means uh, 
talk to your child as you do that. And you know something that, and I, I, I don't want to be hard on Andy Griffith because everybody loves Andy Griffith. And I, I do too. You know, I, I could watch Andy Griffith rerun any time compared to most what's on. But even Andy Griffith show, how many times was there deceit in the Andy Griffith show when somebody was trying to de de deceive somebody else about something even to the point of, you know, maybe stretching the truth just a little bit. Even on Andy Griffith, you could say, now, is that really a good thing? You know, and they were doing that to protect somebody else, but was that a good thing to lie like that, to deceive? So, you know, we can do that with our televisions. Do your research ahead of time. Find out what's going to be on, what it's going to be containing. Don't use the TV as background noise. Don't just leave it on all the time and, as the family goes about their business because what's going to happen? Everything in the world might be on it because nobody's really watching, but when something catches somebody's eye, then they sit down and watch. They may, one, be wasting time that really ought not be wasted that way, or they might be... Uh, enticed by something that really is not good to be watching in the first place. So that's the suggestion here. Do not leave it on as background noise. Do not use it as a babysitter. Do not use it as a babysitter. Regular television. Now you can buy videos and you can, you can use that to actually help your child's education in, in many ways, even uh, spiritually, of a spiritual nature. But this is talking about just, you know, turn on the television, and they'll sit in there and watch that. We've got things to do. We can't be concerned with that right now. You just sit down and watch television. We're, we're saying that whatever comes on the screen, we're okay with, unless we give them some sort of guideline, some sort of uh, uh, structure to go by. Model what you're teaching what you're trying to teach your children. In other words, if you expect them to be selective in their TV viewing, then of course, like all other behaviors in life as a parent, you be selective as well and let them know that you're selective. Let them know this is what our family does. And that, that kid that you go to school with and he tells you some of those stories about what's so, we don't do that in this family. In this family, we choose what is good for us and what God would be pleased with and what would help us to, to grow closer to God and not further away. And simply make that a family, uh, a family rule. And then I've got one more study I want to share with you. Battery in my watch went dead, so I'm going to have to put this out here for time. One more... Uh, study, and it is about what happens, I've got too many studies, that's the problem here, but I'll find it in just a moment. It's about what happens when people start limiting their television and do other good things instead, okay? Research data indicates that families that limit television viewing to a maximum of two hours a day of carefully selected programs are likely to see the following changes in family relationships. Now, these aren't all spiritual, but I would say to you all of them could be part of nurturing spirituality because they're all good changes. Here are the positive changes that, that can take place if you'll just say, and, you know, that doesn't seem like very much. Perhaps that's because we watch too much television in the first place. Two hours? Two hours a day? That's all we can watch? Well, you know, that's really a lot of television right there. But here's, here's what Ray Church has said. Value setting will be taught and reinforced by the family. Families will learn how to establish values and how to reason together. Why? Because we've decided we're only going to watch two hours. That's all we're going to watch. We're going to have to figure out what we're going to watch, why we're going to watch it, what value it's going to be to us. What is this family all about? And we would best do that beginning with a very young age. Number two in the positive significant changes. Relationships 
between parents and youth will increase in families. Now again, I'm not sure why it took a study to bring that to light. If parents and children are not blocked off watching television, even in the same room, much less in separate rooms, for hours at a time, you stop doing that and you limit it to mutually agreed upon two hours or less, what's going to happen? Well, of course parents and children are going to be communicating more. There's more time. There's less, there are less interruptions. You're going to t be talking about the important stuff, about the things that go on, go on throughout the day and, uh, you know, what that child might need to hear, spiritual guidance. Number three, positive significant change. Homework will be completed with less pressure of time. Well, makes sense, doesn't it? There's, there's more time available. If time is not wasted on television, that is of little value or no value or dangerous. Number four, personal conversations will increase substantially. If you have teenagers, do you have trouble getting them to talk? Well, this is not maybe a cure-all, but there's a lot more time for talking if you're not watching television. What happens when you're watching television and somebody says something to somebody else? What happens? You know, don't you? Shh, shh, what a commercial. <laughs> right? I want to hear this part. TV, movie, of course the movie theater, everybody else will shush you too. But if you're not watching all that television, there's time to communicate. And, and your, your, the child might find out that the parent likes to talk about things. The parent might find that the child is more willing to talk about things. And there's that communication that might not otherwise take place. This is what reducing television time does. Uh, number five, children's imaginations will come back to life. How much imagination does it take to watch television? It, it doesn't, does it? They've, Hollywood's already done all the imagining for you. And you just sit there and watch it. However, if a child is confronted with a block of time and, oh, I've got to fill this block of time. How am I going to fill it? and you guide them in the way of some things that are positive, then they start using their imagination on how to do that, which, of course, is, is good for them as they grow. Uh, each family member will become a discriminating selector and evaluator of programs. If the family has two hours of, fam of TV time a night, everybody's going to be involved, and everybody's going to be talking values. And one might say, well, here's why I think we ought to do this. Well, here's why I think we ought to watch this. Or here's why I think we should not watch that. It's going to be value-based instead of random-based, including the children. Parents become, can become family leaders again. How much leadership is involved with telling a child, you go watch television, I've got some things to do. Is, is there any leadership in that? That's sort of like delegating. Delegating to the child their own opportunities to learn values, set standards, decide what they're going to do in life. No leadership there. And that's what parents are all about. Good reading habits may be substituted for television viewing. If, if they're reading things that educate them in, in preparation for school, that's good. If they're reading things to educate themselves for uh, preparation to go to heaven, that's even better, isn't it? They're studying their Bible. They suddenly, hey, you know, we're, we're going to have a Bible class on Sunday or Wednesday. I, I think I'll go ahead and read what we're talking about. I'll read the passage or I'll, if we've got a workbook, I'll read that or whatever it is associated with that class. I, I think I'll study on that some. Because suddenly there is time to do that. So that is from a study about limiting television to two hours a day and everybody being involved in making that decision. Uh, great opportunity. Well, since we only have the five minutes between now and the bell, 
I had another topic to bring up, but what I'm going to do is to share with you a little acrostic here that sort of sums up some of these things. Some of it's new, some of it I've already shared with you. But the acrostic uses the word lemon, L-E-M-O-N. And I thought, you know, that's, that's good. That might be a, uh, a way to remember at least some of the basics. And this came from an issue of uh, Folk, no, Think Magazine, Folk, published by Folk Press, another magazine that I recommend and the material that they produce. Focuspress.com, Think Magazine. Great articles, great coverage of the things we're talking about now and many, many other issues dealing with the church, the family, and uh, Christian evidences. Great stuff. Okay, lemon. L, limit time. Now, that's not kind of what we introduced there in, you know, no more than two hours a day, but limit time. Whether it's watching television, whether it is on the Internet, whether it is uh, some other electronic device that a child is using. Uh, I know Barbara and I tried a number of things back years ago, and this was before there was nearly as much out there, but uh, we, we came up with the idea of uh, giving Josh and Joel uh, little tickets. We got a hold of one of those things where you, just like you buy tickets for an event and pass them out, and they'd get so many tickets per day that you could use this watching television or playing your whatever the Nintendo was at that time. It was much more crude than it is now, <laughs> more simple. You, okay, you can have... Each of these represents a certain amount of time, and you bring me a ticket when you want to use it. And each day, they had their, their number of tickets. But however you want to do it, limit the time that is used on things that do not help a child grow intellectually or spiritually. Limit that time. E, educate ourselves. Each of us that has children or the opportunity to influence children that might not be our own, this is an ever-changing thing, but it's not so complicated that we can't figure out a lot of it. I know Paul Glenn had a class here one time. Maybe we need to have that class again on the Internet and, and safety and things like that. But find out what's going on and what's what your child is capable of with a little electronic device that sits in their hand and be able to guide them to use that wisely, or perhaps not even use it at all if you're not old enough. Monitor the use. Same idea as keeping the, the family computer uh, where everybody can see it. Uh, use the off switch. Oh, off switch. We're spelling lemon out here. Off switch. Uh, call a media-free day. You know, announce it ahead of time so you know, there's no heart attacks, and say... We're going to turn off everything electronic. No outside communications with the world for today. Let's just see how we do. And it might be surprising. And then the N in lemon, never stop talking. This is about parent-child communication and husband and wife communication. Never stop talking. What does media and social media do? It stops conversations. It stops interaction. It stops the role of husbands and wives expressing their feelings to each other. It stops the interaction of parents and children with all those things that they need to know and learn and be guided in. So L-E-M-O-N, -E limit time, educate yourselves, monitor the use, off switch, and never stop talking. Okay, next week we'll move on to another subject, even though we could talk about this for a long time. Appreciate it. Stay, but especially your.